Thank you very much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick things up a little bit uh, and uh, hopefully give you a fairly entertaining, image-rich, and uh, thought-provoking, I'm going to say 37 minutes, not 45. Um, just want to make sure I have all the tools at hand here. Pointer. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I am the managing director of ROM Biodiversity. Um, been at the ROM for two years. I'm going to introduce myself in a second, but very quickly, a glance at what we're going to talk about. Uh, global perspectives, I, I, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this, uh, and, uh, and our research here at the museum will hopefully give you a sense of uh, um, the bigger picture, um, because I feel as though the the conference itself uh, is very focused on Ontario, which is great and is important, but I think we do need to step back uh, once in a while. Give you a, a brief glimpse at this uh, new strategic plan that Janet spoke of this morning, my role in it, and then a few uh, partners uh, and partnerships and programs that we're doing right now. So, yeah, the ROM is a big place. I, have, uh, I still get lost on occasion, uh, wandering through the back halls. There's five million specimens. Uh, easily 350 full-time staff, um, and, and we're 100 years old. We have a lot of history here, um, but at the end of the day, our mission statement that uh, is, is current um, is, is uh, relatively unchanged over the last while. Uh, me, in, in quickly in six bullets, I, I came from Huntsville. Um, I, I think you've heard the rest of it. Uh, the point of this story is, is that I have uh, I spent my, my life here in Ontario trying to advocate for nature in various roles and capacities. Um, an important slide, I think mostly uh, for uh, my acceptance here with the curatorial team, but I think for this group as well, I do have a research background. I understand the methods uh, and practices of science. Um, I did uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, work throughout my MSc and then two or three years into a PhD uh, playing with frog eggs and, and, and other things. Realized quickly that I was probably a better teacher and communicator than I was an academic and my ego was probably not uh, um, well coded from the, the number of people reading my papers on phenotypic plasticity. So moved away from that and into more applied science, um, including my work with the road ecology group, which I'll explain a little later. Uh, I did spend five years at the zoo, uh, sort of uh, uh, improving my communication skills. And really, uh, what I did at the zoo is what I do here. I, I try to bridge the gap between uh, science, uh, deep academic researchers, and a public who is getting uh, more and more disengaged with science um, with the environment, believe it or not. A new Google survey out very recently shows that the Canadian youth are very disengaged with the keywords biodiversity, environment, nature, and other things. So we have a lot of work to do. I have two daughters. Um, both love that I work here, but neither really are exceedingly engaged with nature or outdoor activities anymore. And it's not because we don't do those things, it's, it's because nature, or it's because uh, society has so many uh, stimu stimulants these days. So I find myself here at the ROM, and um, it, it is in this position that uh, um, I'm going to take you through a few stories over the next half an hour. Um, I'm pretty easygoing, so if there are, I, I, I don't want to leave discussion till the end. If there's something pressing, if you, if you absolutely disagree with a point, or if you wanted to raise a point, um, throw your hand up, and I'll, I'll, I'll involve you in the discussion. Um, but quickly, um, I'll take a big step back. So I usually start big presentations with that picture. You remember the picture from 1972 that Apollo 17 took of the Earth? called the Blue Marble. It was that first picture of our planet. Um, and I think it's been used more than any other picture on the internet for different things. It's a really good uh, place to start. Here's the big picture. But thanks to Chris Hadfield, we have um, now thousands and thousands of open sourced images of our planet. And I think the message is the same uh, as what I would have said to the image of our Blue Marble uh, by the Apollo 17 crew. 
Um, but I'm just going to actually stop talking for a moment and let this group digest lunch um, and reflect on 10 images you're about to see of your planet. Um, you'll see uh, how humans have impacted your planet. You'll see pictures uh, of your home. You'll see pictures of uh, vast jungled areas. Um, and, and my goal is by the end of the 10 slides, you do um, A, have digested your lunch, and B, uh, really are comfortable in the sense that I, I am not talking about some specific endangered species of Ontario, but indeed I'm talking about life and biodiversity on our planet. There we are, the center of the universe. <laughs> Amazing interaction between our terrestrial and aquatic environments. is the biggest city in the world. Wonder how many endangered species they have to worry about. Those are all massive massive tankers in the in the bay. Again, you can see the habitat alteration around what what is a man-made you know. Poor Edmonton, that was like March 27th. <laughs> Still totally buried in snow. Another point from that image though is you recognize the image of the Amazon and how powerful that river is, seven times bigger than any other river on earth in terms of discharge. The river going through Edmonton is just as important to the sustainability of the city uh, as the Amazon is to the sustainability of uh, South America, indeed maybe our planet. And again, back home. So, again, I think when we see images of our planet from 30,000, 20,000, 15,000 uh, kilometer resolution, I think it does give you a sense of how big we are, uh, how um, significant the problems are across the board, um, and definitely puts into perspective where we are here in Ontario with the 200 species that we're all concerned with this, this week. Uh, I, I, I know you all know this, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the obvious elephant in the room is, is uh, CO2 emissions. Um, this is the recent paper um, publicized in The Economist very recently, uh, accepted uh, you know, here at the museum. We don't debate evolution anymore and definitely uh, push a very, very specific message on evolution. Uh, we do the same thing now with climate change. Uh, there is no debate. Uh, there is no reason to be wishy-washy about the causes of CO2 emissions, and it is indeed the elephant in the room that sits behind us all on some of these other issues. <laughs> I think you're all dealing with some politics as well as pure ecology and science, so I thought that this was fitting in terms of a transition from what is the elephant climate change to what we're about to talk about for the next 20 minutes, which is uh, biodiversity. So obviously the, the focal species of the media and the public when it comes to climate change is one of our animals, uh, I would say uh, definitely a Canadian iconic species and definitely an animal that's been impacted uh, almost directly by the changing climate in the north. Um, but what the public fails to realize when they see uh, climate change and they, and, they, and they are told what it is and then they're pushed through channels such as Coca-Cola and others that this iconic animal is threatened because of it, the missing gap there is what I'm about to show you and that is 
the polar bear doesn't represent it isn't a good ambassador for biodiversity. The polar bear is a good ambassador for the Arctic, it's a good ambassador for megafauna, but it's not a good ambassador for life. The fact that 96% of all unknown life are insects is not well represented with that image. Here's an image of a snake, a ruby-eyed uh, uh, pit viper, uh, recently discovered by a team, including a ROM scientist in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, brand new animal, not known to science before, uh, probably found for the first time about 14 months ago. So biodiversity, uh, and I, again, I don't think I need to preach to the choir here, but biodiversity is life on Earth. It's everything. It's the diversity in genes, it's the diversity in species, it's the diversity in populations, it's the diversity in ecosystems. It's what sustains us. It's what give give, gives us our fresh water, our clean air, our soil. Um, and without interactions in nature, uh, without the connectivity in nature and all of those life forms that are constantly interacting with one another, we wouldn't exist. So really, um, there are two elephants, climate change and the biodiversity crisis. I, I did work, excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold and I'm sniffling right into this. My, uh, my younger days of research was on, were on frogs. I definitely enjoy frogs. Uh, this particular critter here, painted reed frog, came through our Twitter account from a colleague in Africa who had found it on a leaf uh, in Western Africa but couldn't identify it. Um, so uh, very quickly, um, the ROM herpetological team got together. I sent the image across all through email. We identified it for them. But the point of this slide is, is that probably uh, one in, in, in two frogs and salamanders are, are threatened with extinction or have declining populations. So not just your Jefferson salamander, Salamander here in Ontario. Um, uh, indeed, uh, across the board, there's probably no other group, no other taxa of animals that is as threatened as frogs and amphibians, and it's largely because of uh, those two big elephants uh, uh, degrading habitat for biodiversity and, and climate change. Here's an image I got of a wood turtle, but it was the first animal uh, on the species at a risk list currently that I ever saw in Ontario. I think I was about 10 or 11 in, in or around Algonquin Park. Um, the point of this image is, again, seven out of eight Ontario turtles are threatened, but globally reptiles are probably one in three, one in four uh, snakes, crocodilians, uh, turtles, sea turtles are threatened with extinction. Largely, it's a, I, think, I think it was our friend Jim uh, Bogart who, who made this point really nicely. It's about habitat. It's not about species. It's about where they live and how much room they need to live. And this is some wood turtle habitat here in Ontario. Obviously not too uh, 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 friendly to human development. We wouldn't want to live there. We wouldn't want to put up a house in this particular swamp. This is a big swamp, a huge swamp, uh, with a hydrology cycle that just does, is not hospitable to, to, to humans. So that's the, that's the uh, cost benefit. It would be almost impossible to replace this swamp. So overall benefit then, I'm, I will put it out there to you, is impossible in this situation. You cannot recreate his habitat. Um, so I'll leave that as food for thought. There's a queen snake. Again, its habitat is really convoluted and broken shorelines, another at-risk species here in Ontario. One in four birds, um, one in eight birds globally are threatened, again, mainly because of uh, habitat destruction. Um, 500 years, 150 birds have gone extinct. 10,000 birds on the planet. You put those numbers together and the public isn't gonna think that this is alarming. But when you put it into the context of the actual extinction rate 65 million years ago, the data I just gave you dwarfs it. So the current extinction rate of species on our planet is probably 500 to 1,000 fold higher than what it was at the, uh, at the uh, 65 million year threshold when 95% of life went extinct. Heavy duty stuff, birds are a great example. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brooke later in a program we've done here at the ROM. She was an intern at the ROM last year. We sent her to Haida Gwaii, and she got this picture of uh, a spirit bear, a commodity bear. Um, the point of this slide, again, is uh, it's an it's a, it's a animal who requires some pretty pristine old-growth habitat. Um, and uh, as a flagship species, you protect the bear, you protect the habitat, you protect a lot more. I'm on a bit of a kick right now, that's the, the tie with the elephants on it. Um, uh, really, this slide sums up a lot for me. We, we will probably lose all megafauna within my nine-year-old's adolescent career. So we're talking elephants, rhinos, uh, the big cats are all in trouble, uh, most of them are. Um, Mostly because of habitat loss, but this, this is an interesting slide. The white rhinoceros, who is our iconic specimen in the Shad Gallery, when we built that gallery, we wrote the interpretive signage which uh, told the story of a conservation success. So here is an animal that is near extinct at the turn of the century, 1900. It just was wiped out from poaching, from legal hunting, habitat loss. There was very, very few white rhinos left. A lot of groups caught together, NGOs, ENGOs, government, the South African uh, folks, they pulled their socks up like you are right now, and they saved the white rhino. There, there, there was probably 15,000 of them uh, in 2007. It was a success story. So when we wrote the interpretives on that white rhino, we, we wanted to give some hope to people coming into our gallery, and we said you, a lot can, can happen. For whatever reason, our society has decided, um, again, there's been this huge spike in interest in, uh, in shark fins, horns, tusks. These are, are ridiculous claims that there's some medicinal value in any of these things. And in the last five years, just with white rhinos, exponential increase in, in, the, uh, in the poaching of the animals. So that's kind of sorry, doom and gloomy. I'm going to turn it a little bit now to um, uh, where, the, where the ROM comes in. Uh, here is an animal that has never before been seen in Canada, and one of our scientists found it in the Rouge Park uh, last summer. So it is the only tarantula species in, in the Toronto area, uh, and my point here is, is that there's still, there's still hope, but we need to start thinking about these guys. Who knows what that is, other than an ant? It's a, it's a leaf cutter ant. Um, oh my goodness, my nose. Um, my, my story here is going to switch gears to a slide I'm about to show you. The leaf cutter ant is a remarkable outreach specimen because its very small ecosystem includes three kingdoms, fungi, uh, uh, plants, and, and of course them as animals. And all, all the entire system, which we show in the gallery, depends on a whole pile of species within each kingdom present and working to feed off one another. The bigger point here is again that insects, are running this world. And we don't know very much about them at all. We know probably 97, 98% of all mammals on Earth, even though Burton Lim, a curator here at the ROM, found a new uh, uh, mammal species in Guyana last year. Sometimes you find a new mammal, sometimes you find a new reptile, every now and then you'll find a new bird, but basically we know the vertebrates pretty well. But the vertebrates are only about 3% of life. The other 97% of life are invertebrates, and of those invertebrates, you know, uh, uh, all of the invertebrates included, insects it's, is where it's at. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a few stories now around the importance of research, um, which, and don't get me wrong here, I have a point that is going to have huge relevance for you. I'm, I'm talking global to act local. So the end of my presentation will really, I think, have some profound implications for you all, but I'm building up to that <laughs> thesis, if you will. So here at the museum uh, and, and natural history museums all over the world, that's what we do. Um, and in the blue is, is 
who we partner with, and I think what some of our, our friends in the audience do, and indeed what we're more and more doing, uh, trying to connect our work with it. But at the end of the day, um, natural history museums have a huge role to play because of that previous slide. We still need so much work on what's going on in our world. And so I'm, I'm coming from a conservation advocacy background, and man, was I received with some, some you know, nervousness around here. There is an old school club here at the museum, uh, definitely taxonomists. Uh, they, they like to keep fairly arm's length from, from pure applied conservation, but that's, where, that's why I was hired. That's why I'm here, to bridge that gap. And where we've come to a common ground is um, we need to connect with applied conservationists and we need to make relevant our work uh, to you so that we can continue to do what we do to support what, what you do. So, a few stories. Claire Healy, uh, our invertebrate zoologist, she studies the tapeworms of sharks. How enthralling is that? Um, pretty incredible looking creatures, brand new species to science that she discovered a couple of years ago. In fact, Claire has discovered a whole order of animal life. So quick reminder, you know, the, the, the hierarchy, species, genera, family, uh, order. Like we're talking a whole order of life. How do you, how do you get the public interested in tapeworms of sharks. Well, we embedded her research into an exhibit at last year's Green Living Show about Canada's oceans. So basically, we, we told the public there are 41 species of sharks in, in Canada. Did you know that? We, we hung all these sharks, we had this great display, and then right in the middle, we put Claire's research, which made a huge impact on the audience. Um, um, so her work was, was a featured part of it, and I don't think uh, the kids, the 37,000 people that would have experienced Claire's research in any other way, would have engaged it. But because of the way we placed it within a broader context, it was engaging. And then for the academic community, we built out a symposium uh, with, with top-level politicians and academics and conservation biologists, and threw Claire into the agenda, again, trying to get that work out with relevance to the broader picture. Doug Curry, he is the, he is the guy on black flies in the world. He wrote the book on black flies. Nobody knows more about black flies than Doug Curry. Um, and it becomes a little bit hard sometimes, you know? You want Doug to do something around insects in general. He's like, well, how can I get my black fly work into this? And so it's, it's really quite tough. But the way we do it is we play off of his most re recent research project, which um, is going to come out in the fall in a very big peer-reviewed publication, and I think it's going to change the way people uh, consider taxonomy and, and pure research, because his work is going to shed some very uh, important light on climate change. He's got data from 50 years ago around biting flies in the north, and he's gone back up with some NSERC funding, collected all the same data over the last two years in the same areas, uh, and uh, I can't say too much more about it, but the point is, is that his work with the black fly, that little bug that he loves so, so much and knows so much about, is now telling us stories around our changing climate uh, and definitively allowing people to remark on um, uh, what other ecological consequences might fall out of a changing climate. Chris Darling, he's my favorite guy right now. I mean, they're all, I, and again, I could have talked about all 27 of them. I only have time to talk about a few, so, and, and please take in jest my, the fact that he's my favorite um, because they're all great. But Chris is just awesome. He, is, he likes parasitic wasps. So we're talking, you know, this thing here, brand new to science, discovered and described by Chris. We're talking its total length is about a millimeter and a half, like minute. Um, how do we make his work relevant and how is this work relevant to you? We are sending Chris to Borneo uh, in, in a week, and he'll go uh, with this tent uh, with uh, a bunch of mycologists and mammologists to uh, the heart of Borneo to help find 
uh, new species of insects, fungi, and mammals that will then inform WWF International around how they can better plan uh, their park network. During March break, we set up the tent, and over 1,500 kids signed the tent and talked to Chris about cicadas and parasitic wasps and, and this sort of thing. Um, Chris had a great dinner party for us. It was, uh, you know, Malaysian-style longhouse dinner. Uh, it was a blast, and he really got into character. That's my, that's my dish right there. <laughs> and uh, it was just a really nice way to send off uh, the team to Borneo. Another, another piece of work that's probably more applicable to conservation biology is Alan's work with red knots. Here's a bird that travels from the tip of Argentina to the, to the Arctic. I think it's the second uh, longest migratory uh, shorebird, uh, longest distance migratory shorebird on Earth. And Alan basically uh, loves to share his work about this critically endangered bird. The population has declined substantially over the last while. And this is Alan here speaking with his colleague from Argentina, live Skype in our Earth Ranger studio with, you know, about 1,000 kids walk through that space that day. So they all got to experience Alan, a scientist here in Toronto, and uh, his colleague uh, in Argentina in real time. We did another fun project with a, a group called Dodo Lab where <laughs> this, is, this is probably a whole other story, and I'll talk to you about it over drinks tonight, but basically, Alan, uh, we brought the dodo out from extinction, and it ran around the museum for a day talking about the plight of shorebirds. Now, a few of you here, my herpetological colleagues, will recognize this guy, Dr. Bob Murphy. And so here's another guy who's been at the ROM for 35 years, and he's uh, uh, brought a snake out for International Year of the Snake, Chinese Heritage Day, and that's our CEO. Can you tell which one really likes snakes? <laughs> so just to give you an idea of where we're at here, and I'll check my time. Again, the first part of that talk, um, it wasn't meant to be too tangential. It was meant to have some focus, and the focus, again, was uh, the planet is big. Uh, there is an incredible diversity of life on the planet. Uh, that diversity of life, in terms of uh, what we don't know about it, is largely the little things. You do have resources right here in your own backyard who can help you understand that concept, which I think will support your efforts towards doing what you do. And I think Alan's work in particular shows you how that leap can, can happen. And, and I'm going to spend the, the, the last sort of five, ten minutes here on, on the rest. So here is a concept drawing of the ROM. So this was back when they were just planning on doing it. I don't think there's ever, ever been a more polarizing or controversial building in downtown Toronto. People either love it or they really, really don't love it. Um, nevertheless, they spent 10 years, $418 million uh, building this crystal, building the outside of a building. But they failed to think about what was going on on the inside. They had this big, beautiful crystal, and they had these curators that tucked away for 10 years and said, whoo, nobody's worrying about me. They're building a crystal. I'm going to go away and do my research. And the, and the separation happened. So we had a back of house that was totally disengaged from our front of house. Most of the people doing front of house work were students, graduate students, um, high school students during March break. And they were just running around this crystal, um, disengaged from what we actually did. So now we have this new strategic plan, um, which Janet described, uh, which is really about building us from the inside out. And that's, that's my role. And I'm going to probably whip through a few of these slides pretty quickly, but it is a new way of working completely, and uh, uh, bringing these cura curators out, making their research relevant, making their programs relevant to the public is what the, the next little while is about. Ah, my, my font and pictures have weirdly gone awry, but no matter. So hopefully you'll get a chance to tour the Life in Crisis Shad Gallery. It is our main program vehicle. It's where I spend, uh, um, where we spend most of our time, sort of delivering programs. Um, it's the, you know, it's the most next to Blockbusters. It's the most popular gallery in the in the museum, um, which is encouraging, considering biodiversity is a tough uh, a tough subject to get across to folks. 
We do a whole pile of things in there, um, including bringing out hands-on animals. Uh, we have about 7,000 kids come through a year explicitly for curriculum-based learning, another 150,000 for informal learning. Um, we have an Earth Ranger studio, uh, which is about a 3,000 square foot room, multi-purpose room. We do a whole pile of things in there, including partnering with our colleagues at Earth Rangers, who again is an applied conservation group uh, on their live animal show. The most recent program in there was a, was a partnership we did with a group called FLAP. Uh, we brought out 2,400 dead birds, all of which had been killed by Toronto buildings in the last 12 weeks. Uh, some one million birds a year uh, die in downtown Toronto alone. So that's more than cats uh, and other causes. They're flying into buildings, you know this, right? They're flying into buildings because the lights are on at night, or they're flying into buildings because they see their reflection during the day and consider it habitat. That's a lot of uh, death. Um, we, we also bring our, our knowledge to outside the museum, uh, including building curriculum for teachers, using our curatorial knowledge to help us do that. This month is all about biodiversity, as Janet said. And normally that banner in the front of the building is dedicated to blockbusters. So like the, the Maya exhibit, the, the dinosaur exhibit, the uh, Dead, Scree, Scree, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but for the first time in a long time, programs got access to what is uh, high real estate, which is really great. And I think that just shows the executive uh, uh, commitment to making programs uh, uh, front and center. Um, this was a great little video that I was gonna show you, and we showed it last night with Mark and Tom and Ann, but it's not, it, it can't work. But if you want to see it, I'll show it to you another time or I'll send it to you in the Dropbox. Here is a rough sketch of planning the month quickly. It was, it was nuts. The point of our month of biodiversity is to somehow get our scientists from, again, from back of house to front of house in ways that engage the public. Here's Oliver talking to a, uh, a young high school student about uh, sequencing the DNA from the extinct moa bird. Uh, Oliver is very interested in de-extinction and is part of a collaborative team on that. Uh, the jury is out on that applicability. Um, entirely out on that. Um, here is a really revolutionary way that we're bringing our curators out to the front of house. It's called a Google Hangout. That's me and the mycology team live to YouTube uh, every Tuesday and Thursday throughout the month from noon until 12.30. It's like a lunch and learn, but for the world. So instead of bringing, we, we do lunch and learns all the time, but instead of bringing 15 or 20 people into our boardroom and dealing with all that registration um, uh, fiasco, we just go live to YouTube at noon broadcast it, you can watch from our website, you can watch from uh, YouTube itself, or if you have a Google Plus account, you can actually come on and chat with us, and we do a talk, and a very informal chat. We talked about psilocybin, we talked about, uh, that's magic mushrooms, we talked about um, his work in Borneo, we talked about all kinds of fun stuff and took in questions from the audience. Right now, in April, um, uh, Erling Holm, I think who many of you know, is doing workshops in Guelph on species at risk fish. There's probably nobody more knowledgeable about uh, SAR fish species in Ontario than Erling. We've written the book on freshwater fishes of Ontario, same with herps and birds and, and flowers. Um, and uh, Erling is in Guelph for the next three weeks delivering workshops to folks like you, consultants mainly, and species at risk biologists on, on their fish. That's my daughter up there on the right, uh, showing off uh, the Great Lakes program. I did want to quickly plug this one. Um, this is a, a program we're doing at the end of the month with youth, 250 select environmental youth are going to come to the museum and hang out with Roberta Bondar and Sebastian Salgado and have workshops from 12 of Ontario's best environmental groups. Again, trying to inspire that group, that tough category, 14 to 22 year olds around uh, the environment. So I've got about two minutes left and I promise to keep to it, but I am going to just showcase three programs that I think are applicable to you. Um, the first one is a program we developed last year around visual communication. In a nutshell, Coke, um, the big marketing players, they know how to change behavior. They know how to make people do something that they might not have otherwise done. 
environmentalists and the environmental sector, we're so bad at it. We're just so bad at it. So we've got this new program which basically takes an environmental graduate student, some level of understanding, an undergraduate degree or a graduate diploma somewhere, some interest in the arts, videography, writing, dance, we have dancers come, and then putting them together to create a unified student capable of telling good stories using visual communication to change the way the environmental sector runs. I think this group needs, and no offense at all, because we're in the same boat, but I think this group needs a lot of help when it comes to visual communication. And again, no offense, but I sat through the morning, I know this stuff, I know the ESA, I know what's going on. But man, could it have been any... Um, <laughs> less visually stimulating. <laughs> great teachers, great groups. Uh, we've partnered with the National Geographic, with the ILCP, with other leading visual communicators to bring their expertise into house. And then the students get to do wonderful projects. Brennan at the back of the room right now, if you can give a wave. He's an instructor in the program uh, and obviously uh, fundamentally important to its success. The second of three projects that I'm going to tell you about is our BioBlitz. We partnered with a bunch of groups, including Ontario Nature, the zoo, and we went out to Rouge Park last year and documented more species in 24 hours than any other group has ever done, ever. So we found just shy of 1,500 species in 24 hours, and whatever, it was what it was. We gave the data to the Rouge Park so that they know they have these animals in there, but what it really did was it, it basically elevated interest in biodiversity and biodiversity experts, taxonomists, um, for, for the future. The next BioBlitz is on the 14th and 15th of September, noon to noon. Uh, single malt starts at about midnight. You're all welcome to come. Check out the website, ontariobioblitz.ca. And then the final uh, program project that I wanted to describe was, was particularly my role in the Ontario Road Ecology Group. I think I've heard the word road mortality ooh, a half dozen times this morning. I think I've read the concept of road mortality in almost every recovery plan out there. Indeed, for most of the herps, a lot of the birds, many of the mammals, roads and road impacts, one of the biggest threats to wildlife in Ontario. And we have a good uh, resource uh, for Ontarians um, to use, and that is um, the Ontario Road Ecology Group. So I'll close there by saying the OREG is in a position to partner with any and all of you on helping you understand um, what the municipal role is, what the provincial role is, how you can engage volunteers and the public to help with road-related issues. Plus, we have a vast network of scientists who are helping us uh, understand the issue, particularly uh, Jochen Jager at uh, Concordia and Lenore Fairhag at Carleton, and Kerry Gunson in the back of the room is arguably the best road ecologist in, in the province. We bring the network together into one spot so that it's a resource for you to make informed uh, decisions about your uh, projects and uh, municipalities. So on that note, I will stop and see if there's any questions. Or comments. <laughs>